Okay, so to start our discussion about this grammar of graphics idea, um, we need to go over a little bit of history and do a little story time. So this painting here is of the uh, War of 1812, which is not actually the same War of 1812 that was fought in the United States where uh, Britain used Canada to help invade the United States and they burned down the White House. That's a completely different War of 1812. This War of 1812 was led by Napoleon, who invaded Russia in, during the winter of 1812. And this is kind of the famous apocryphal story of like, never invade, ri invade Russia during the winter because um, it's bad, and so Hitler didn't actually follow that advice. Um, and so it's, it's not actually an apocryphal story, it happened. Um, uh, Napoleon's forces lost a ton of people because of their retreat from Moscow in the middle of the winter which was not a wise decision um, militarily. And so this painting here shows the Russian army escaping from Moscow in the middle of the winter, and it ended up being really bad for them. Um, and we can actually tell this story um, using data, um, using a few different data points here. And so one way of looking at this is that the, there was actually a very long distance that they had to travel. And so they were in, in Moscow here, and then they had to travel all the way to Vilnius, Lithuania, which is where kind of the main French army base was at that point, um, which is like a thousand kilometers. Um, had they had a car, it would have taken like 12 hours to, to drive. Um, but it took them several months of marching from Moscow to Vilnius. Um, so that's part of the story of why it was so bad and tragic for uh, Napoleon's army. Another way of looking at it is the temperatures. It was very cold as they were marching away from Moscow. So if you look at this, this is the degrees Celsius. Um, the day they left Moscow is zero degrees Celsius, um, which is 32 degrees in Fahrenheit, which is pretty cold. Um, and as they um, kept retreating from Moscow, it got colder and colder and colder um, until it was negative 30 degrees Celsius, which is almost negative 30 um, Fahrenheit. Um, and so that's pretty cold um, for um, trying to retreat from a battle or from a war. Um, so that's another data point we can look at. We can also look at the number of deaths as they um, invaded and retreated. And so if we look at this very simple pie chart, we see that the vast majority of his grand army died. Um, only this very tiny sliver um, survived the, the retreat. Um, the problem with telling the story this way, with three different data points, we have the, the distance, um, we have the temperatures, and we have the number of deaths, is that we don't get the whole complete picture. We just have little data points, and so we don't know when these people died, how that was connected to temperature, at what point during their retreats did they die. Um, and so what we can do is we can actually combine all of these data points into one graphic and be able to tell a much richer story. So this was actually done. So this was um, made by a, a French statistician named Joseph Minard. Um, he made it in 1869, which was a few decades after the invasion and the retreat. Um, uh, statisticians today, um, one named Edward Tufte, who's kind of the grandfather of data visualization, he has called this the greatest data visualization in history. Don't know if I totally agree with him. It is kind of hard to wrap your head around initially. Um, we'll walk through all of the different parts here, and once you see the parts, it'll make a lot more sense. Um, but um, kind of on its right when you look at it on its own, it, it's hard to understand. Um, the cool thing about this, though, is that it tells a very complete story once you understand all of the pieces. So ignore the the brown area and the black area here, and just look here, there's actually labels on this chart um, that show that it's a map. So here, this is Vilnius, this is Lithuania. Um, you see different rivers drawn onto the map here. You can see as they're marching, they went from Vilnius, they stopped in Smolensk, um, they made it all the way to Moscow, and then you can see um, kind of main land formations and, and rivers and stuff. And so this is a map. Um, this gray area, or this, this brown area and this black area, that is the path that the army took on its way to Moscow and on its way back from Moscow. Um, it's colored by the direction they're marching. So this brown shows their direction as they're going to Moscow. The black shows their direction in the retreat. 
And so it's mapped directly onto um, this map here. So you can trace what the army was doing, which is pretty cool. Um, another thing that happens is the width of this uh, gray area or brown area and this black area represents how many people were in the army at the time. So and it has numbers. If you zoom in carefully onto this onto this chart here, you can actually see that they started off in um, outside of Vilnius with 422,000 soldiers. Um, and so they started marching with those 422,000. Um, there were some major battles at Smolensk and other places where they started dropping significantly. So by the time they got to Smolensk here, um, they started off with 422,000. They were down to 145,000 by the time they got here. Um, by the time they finally made it to Moscow, they were down to $110,000, or soldiers, not dollars. Um, and so you can see the width of this thing. It started off really wide, and by the time they got to Moscow, they've lost a ton of people. Um, they retreat from Moscow with the 100,000 100, that made it, um, but you can see how fast this starts shrinking as they get further and further away from Moscow. By the time they reach all the way back to where they started, um, they had 10,000 troops, um, which is a huge difference from the, the 422,000 that they started off with. Um, and so, like, that shows kind of the devastating losses that they had because of this, this invasion of Moscow. Um, so that, that tells a lot of the story. Another element of this chart is this extra chart down at the bottom here that actually shows the temperature um, and the date um, as they were retreating. So this only applies to this black line. So it shows this isn't actually in Celsius. This is in like French Revolution um, units because they, they tried to recreate the calendar and they created, recreated kind of the Celsius scale. So it's not the same degrees. Um, but you can see that it does get cold. And so they start off leaving Moscow when it's zero degrees in whatever their French Revolution scale is. Um, and then as they're marching, you can see how fast they're marching. Um, again, these aren't like actual months because they're the French Revolution months. But you can, you can see they're going. It starts getting cold, negative 21 here. It warms up to negative 11, and then it drops to negative 30. And that's where they see huge substantial losses. And so by the time they get back to Vilnius and beyond, they've lost the majority of their initial army. And so that whole story about um, starting off with a giant army, marching, following this precise path, and then retreating when it's freezing cold and seeing how long it takes to retreat, um, you can tell that whole story with just this one graph. Um, and so it incorporates all of those different components of data into to one image, which is which is pretty exciting and um, it lets you communicate a lot more than just having a pie chart and a map. Um, and so that is important to cover here because this introduces this concept of the grammar of graphics. Um, if you've noticed, as I was talking about kind of having the, the size of this path represented something, the color of the path represented something, the, the x-axis represents something, the y-axis represents something, um, in the grammar of graphics, what you have is specific elements of data that get mapped on to parts of a graph. And so the way we talk about that in this, this language of the data, or uh, the language of the grammar of graphics here, is we map data onto, or we map data onto aesthetics. This was invented by a guy named Leland Wilkinson in 2005-ish in a book called The Grammar of Graphics. And so essentially what we have is we have things called aesthetics. So the position, um, so like an x-axis, a y-axis, shapes, colors, sizes, um, sh uh, other things like that, um, that get mapped on to specific values in a data set. And so as long as you have that mapping, that's how you can represent data um, on a graph. So with the Minard plot, we have six different variables in a data set that are all getting represented at the same time um, through different aesthetics and different geometric versions of it. Um, so we have longitude and latitude, latitude for the x and y axis, so it was an actual map. And then those were represented by points and texts. You could actually see like the points for where the cities were. Um, there, you could trace where the path was. Um, along that X and Y axis. And so that kind of set up the field for um, the army size and the direction and other things on there. 
But the important part here is that if there was a data set that had the longitude and latitude of all of the cities, those get mapped on to the x-axis and the y-axis. Army size here, um, that's the size of that, of that path. And it was bigger when the army was big and smaller when the army was small. And so that was like an actual column that was mapped onto the size, like the width of that path. And that was represented geometrically or graphically as a path. Um, the direction of the army was represented as color. So you could see it as it was advancing and retreating. Um, and that was also shown as part of the path there. With the subplot that was down below showing the date and the temperature, um, those used a different x-axis and y-axis. That wasn't longitude and latitude. That was just the date and then the temperature. So we had um, mapping those columns onto specific parts of the graph. And then that was represented with a line and with text along the line. And so what we have is data that's in a specific data set that is mapped onto a portion of the graph itself. And then there's some geometric element that shows that mapping. And so that's, this is the grammar of graphics here. You have data, you have aesthetics, and you have geometries or the graphic elements that show the aesthetic mappings. Um, the cool thing about the ggplot function that you'll be working with today and for the rest of the mini mester is that it follows this grammar of graphics uh, perfectly. The reason it's called ggplot, the gg stands for grammar of graphics plot. So the author of ggplot, Hadley Wickham, um, he read um, Leland Wilkinson's book and then essentially adapted it for R and followed all of um, kind of the, the grammatical requirements for that book. So when you're using ggplot, it's really convenient because it, it follows that. So if you have a data set with these columns, longitude, latitude, army size, etc., you use this AES function, which stands for aesthetic, and then you can set x equals something, and y equals latitude, and size equals army size, and color equals direction. And then you can plot these things um, with specific geometries. And so if you want points on the graph showing where the cities are, you can use geom point. If you want a path that connects all of the places where the army is going and changes width depending on how big the army is, then you can use geom path. If you want to show the temperature over time, you have geom line. If you want to put actual text, you have geom text. And so you have kind of this, this conceptual mapping of the aesthetic and the geometry. And then the actual code for it follows very, very similarly. So when you're using ggplot, you follow this template here. And you'll get lots of practice with this in the lesson that you'll work through and in the assignment that you'll have, um, where you use the ggplot function, and then you feed it the name of a data set that you have loaded into R. Then you add the mappings that you have. And so if you want the x-axis to be something and the y-axis to be something, you specify all of that here in the mappings. And then you tell it what geometric function to use to plot those, those mappings. So with this Minard plot, it would look something like this. If we had a data set named troops, then we would want to have a path that shows um, x with the longitude, y with the latitude, and then the color of the path is going to be the direction of the army, and the size of the path is going to be the survivors, um, the number of survivors. We're not going to worry about the the temperature and date plot, that's technically a second plot that they put under it, and so we're not going to deal with that. But just just the, the weird paths that they had on the map, that's what we're going to work with here. So if we had a data set that looks like this, this is a data set named Troops. We have a column for longitude, latitude, direction, survivors. Um, we can write this code here, so it's going to use this data set, it's going to use a path, and it's going to map x to that column, y to that column, color to that column, and size to that column. And once we do that, we end up with a graph that looks like this. It does not look as nice and clean as Minard's plot, because he drew it by hand and he made it super fancy, um, spent lots of time on it. This has just got spat out from ggplot. Um, but it does show the, the, the same principles here, where he, they start off here with lots and lots of survivors. They make it to Moscow, and it's shrunken. And then as they're leaving from Moscow, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. By the time they get here, it's down to 10,000. So it does tell the same story. It's just not as nice. We can do lots of refining. We can match the same color. We can, right now, this is kind of stretched out um, um, where it, it doesn't actually fit with the map. We need to kind of shrink that rectangle down and make it wider. 
Um, we can do other enhancements, but kind of the basic story is there, um, where we have specific columns in that data set mapped onto elements of this graph. Um, in your readings for today, you saw another example of this. We have Hans Rosling here, um, who was the guy who did the showing 200 years of change in, in four minutes with the animated uh, graphic showing health and wealth. Um, and so he's, he's famous um, for TED Talks and stuff because he used the same idea of the grammar of graphics to show um, the relationship between health and wealth. He unfortunately died a few years ago of cancer. Um, he does have um, a cool book out that was just published a couple years ago posthumously. You should check that out. That out. It's cool. Um, so this, this is what you saw in that short video. This is from his website. He has a project called Gapminder um, that you can go to and download all of the health and wealth data and a whole bunch of other data sets. And so if you look at this, we can figure out which variables are mapped onto which graphical elements in, in this plot here. So if we look at the x-axis, we have income, which is GDP per capita. If we look at the y-axis, we have life expectancy, which is life expectancy. Um, so that's our x and our y. Um, what is, like we have, we have points here, so we're using geom point. Um, had we done like geom line, it would have connected all of the dots together as like a line, and that would be really hard to read. Um, these dots are colored by continent. And so you can tell these big, these big pink dots here are China and India, and so that's going to be our Asia dots. Um, these blue dots down here are Africa dots, and then these are other continents. And these dots are sized by population. Um, the larger dots are big countries, the smaller dots are small countries. And so, like the Minard plot, where we have multiple columns in our data set mapped onto something in the graph, we have the same thing here, um, where we have um, an x-axis, we have a y-axis, um, we have size, and we have color. And so if we make this little table here, we can see that. Um, these are the columns in the data set, this is how they're mapped onto parts of the graph, and this is how they're shown on the graph. They're all points, just sized differently and colored differently. Okay, so if we have a data set that looks like this, this is that Gapminder data for just 2007. And so if you imagine we have these five columns here, and it keeps going for all the different countries. If we wrote code like this, where it says data equals, here's our data set, Here's our mapping for all of the geoms that come after. So X is going to be GDP per capita, Y is going to be life expectancy, color is going to be continent, size is going to be population. Um, we're going to add geom point so that we'll show them as points. And then if you notice, we added one extra little layer here. That just changes the X axis to be on a log scale instead of on a regular scale. And that's because there are huge gaps between countries that where GDP per capita is like $30,000 versus $300 for some countries. And so that's, that's something that Hans Rosling did as well. If you look back here, you see it's going from 500 to 1,000 and then it doubles to 2,000, doubles to 4,000, 8,000. So that's a log scale. Um, we'll be working with those later in the semester as well. Um, so that's, that's what we're going to do. So if we, if we use this code right here, it should generate a plot that looks like this, which is the same plot that Hans Rosling was using, um, just static, and we haven't changed any colors, and we haven't made it fancy. Um, but it follows the grammar of graphics idea, where we have specific data points mapped onto x values and y values, colored by a specific, uh, a specific variable with continent, and sized by a specific variable with population. And so it, it, it lets us kind of describe um, in fairly good detail this relationship between health and wealth. And we can tell more complicated stories um, because we can see kind of patterns here. We can see Africa down here. We can see Asia here. We can see Europe with the blue dots here. And we can see kind of a bigger spread with the Americas. This is probably the United States and Canada. And then we have Latin America down here. So you can tell a lot. Um, a lot more complicated story than just showing the number of countries in different continents and population across 
different countries. And so because we're using this grammar of graphics idea, we can kind of shove lots of pieces of information and lots more variables from our data set into one graphic and get really dense information, uh, dense information rich graphics. Um, so that is kind of a basic overview of this idea of the grammar of graphics.